and I would really appreciate it if you would stop uh, Rob Taylor from blathering on and on. talk show hosts, callers or guests on the Rob Taylor Report do not necessarily represent the opinions of the hosting platform, subsidiaries, sponsors, or possibly anyone else on the planet or the known universe. From the tinfoil and lead line broadcast bunker on the beautiful southern coast of Oregon, it's the Rob Taylor Report. So strap yourself in, your weekly political therapy session is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is the nearly famous Rob Taylor. Hey, Coos County. Hey, Oregon, America, and beyond. I want to thank you all for joining me for another episode of the Rob Taylor Report. I appreciate you all tuning in. Uh, as soon as Matt Holman comes on the air, we're going to be able to play another game of Where's 3H Tree Service. He hasn't, he may have forgotten. He may be 90 feet up in the air, but... Uh, uh, I'm just going to go over real quick. We're, we play 3H, where's 3H Tree Service? And uh, we're, I'm going to go ahead and start the game. Uh, there's a $50 prize for it. Uh, let me tell you what the rules are. Uh, when you hear the round starts, the first person to find Matt Holman and in or find Matt Holman for 3H Tree Service, you will get win the grand prize. There's somewhere in the county. We'll come on in a few minutes and give you a few more hints. Uh, the playing area covers all of Coos County. So until you get those hints, you really don't know where he's at. There will only be one winner, one winner per round, I promise you. And the round ends when we have a winner or when announced by the Rob Taylor Report podcast. Uh, people who are inel ineligible to win the prize include family and employees of 3H Tree Service. Anyone involved with hiring or contracting with 3H Tree Service, anyone who is a known criminal in Coos County, because we don't want to support your fentanyl habit, and uh, anyone uh, who has won a round of 3H Tree Service in the last 30 days. And so I'm going to go ahead and start that round. And uh, maybe when Matt comes on here, um, he will tell us it's, uh, uh, you know, where he's at give us a little bit of a clue but the round has started and i'm bringing on a really cool guest today um his name is nate hochman i hope i'm pronouncing that right i'll ask him when i get him on here but his name is nate and he he's written a lot of really good articles and i think he's had a lot of uh, phenomenal experiences and we're going to talk about a few of those experiences but i want to talk about the myth of the melting pot and this is something that i think uh, i myself have seen over the years and is very disturbing to me and that's why i wanted to have this young man on the show to talk about what he sees as the problem or the myth with the melting pot and so joining me right now is nate holman nate how you doing man i'm doing well how about yourself i am not doing too bad and uh, from what i understand you are a native of oregon not just that i'm a native of portland like i was telling you uh before the show which is yeah as i said not exactly a bastion of uh right-wing politics these days but i am and i you know, for all the political issues, I, I love Oregon dearly. And out here on the East Coast, I miss it a lot. I, you know, it's uh, Oregon. I, I, I hate the politics in Oregon, but I sure. love the state and I yeah. love being out here, especially out here on the Southern coast. I mean, in June, July, August, and probably all the way up to October before it starts raining again, it's some of the most beautiful place in the world that you could live. In fact, I don't know if you're familiar with Trevor Loudon, He's from New Zealand. He wrote the book, uh, The Enemies from Within. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, he's from New Zealand and he comes out here because he loves the scenery. And I'm like, wow, if he, anyone who lives in New Zealand and loves to come out here to see the scenery, it's it's wild. But it's funny you say you're, you're from Portland. When did you leave Portland? Well, I went, up to, went to college out in Colorado. Uh, so around that time is when I kind of uh, – 
left permanently. But uh, but and then I was in D.C., Florida, D.C., et cetera. Um, but no, I, I mean, I totally agree. My what I always tell people, my conservative friends out here in D.C. is Oregon is the most beautiful place in the world run by the worst people in the world. <laughs> That's generally it's my, my amazing. Law. I don't know how it happened. I mean, I got my suspicions. It seems a coincidence, uh, and I don't know how much you pay attention to voter integrity, but it seems like when we voted in, and the voters put this in place, we voted in in the first state in the union to have mail-in ballots. And Mm -hmm. as soon as we voted in mail-in ballots, we became a one-party state. And I don't know if there's a coincidence there, but it just seems odd that that's how that's been since the time we started that initiative totally yeah it's look it's it's multiple things right you have a bunch of californians moving in who are liberal other stuff is making it bluer but that the mail-in ballot issue this is the problem is once democrats take power in these states then they have the power to implement these electioneering systems with ballot harvesting and you know your viewers are all familiar with it and that means they basically lock in a system where they can never lose again. And I think that's definitely what happened in in Oregon. How did you become a conservative growing up in Portland? That must, that must have been really weird because I imagine all your friends, you know, in high school and, and otherwise were probably just, just know in Portland, we're not that conservative. Yeah. You know, it actually, it's funny. I became a conservative because I was growing up in Portland. It's funny. I mean, I love my parents to death. I've got to get a great relationship with them, but they're like old school kind of moderate Clinton Democrats. You know, they're not crazy. Yeah. They're not radical, but I, I think my dad might've voted um, for Christine Drazen in this election. So every once in a while I'll vote for a Republican, but he's basically, basically a Democrat. Um, and my brother and I, their two kids somehow became crazy frothing at the mouth, right wingers, uh, both of us. <laughs> Which is funny because usually it's the other way around. Usually it's the conservative yeah. kids go off to college and become godless liberals. And these two, you know, good old liberals raised somehow right. two conservative Republican kids. But it was a it was a reaction, really, to what I was seeing in Portland. I mean, I was in a high school that was very left wing, then I went to a college that was very left wing, and it was it became very clear to me as soon as I could have independent political thoughts that like, you know, whatever these people are, I'm not that. You know, that was the first reaction before I even figured out as a conservative, I knew I wasn't left wing because these people are crazy. So then you kind of unravel that thread and you get to the end and you figure out you're a conservative. Now, I um, I go by uh, a libertarian. I'm 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 more conservative than most of my conservative friends. Mm -hmm. And do you find yourself having to describe yourself that way to some people and maybe you know, not so conservative. What, you know, do you, do you find anything even wrong with the libertarian moniker or do you, are you considered a hardcore conservative? Well, I'm not a libertarian, uh, which is not to say that I don't, don't agree with libertarians on a bunch of stuff. I think if you are a conservative, you have a bunch of libertarian views on any number of issues. And actually in some ways I've become more libertarian on certain view on certain issues over the past couple of years. But I'm a, I mean, people debate whether or not it's accurate to say conservative now because it's like, what are we conserving when there's nothing left to conserve? But I'm a man of the right. I'm a right winger. That's certainly I am. And the secondary titles, I think other people can quibble up, but I'm on the right. Um, And I've known that, uh, you know, because I've been reading some of your articles, I like to investigate the people before I interview them. And I found some of your articles were just absolutely intriguing. I shared several of them on social media. I thought they were very good. Um, There was one on parental rights that I thought was really interesting. And um, you just did one recently. And this is why I had you on the show to talk about the myth of the melting pot. And I completely agree with you after reading that article, but I, I, if you would go ahead and tell people what, what did, what is the melting pot as far as that American myth? Right. So everyone who has been involved in immigration policy and the debates over immigration politics over the last 50 years has heard the term melting pot. It's this sort of uh, phrase that Americans love to use about our immigration system, where the idea is it doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter where you're from. Anyone can become American. Right. That's something that conservatives used to say. It's like uh, if you're not a Frenchman, you can't ever become fully French. If you're not uh, you know, Australian, you can never become fully Australian, but anyone can become American. And the idea of the melting pot is 
it's that's the idea of America is you throw everything into it. It all melts together and you somehow get out an American out of the melting pot. And my argument is, especially based on what we've seen over the last decade, we really need to rethink that analogy and really how, what, what its implications are. Because what we've seen over the past decade, as you've had mass immigration continue to ratchet up, as our sort of collective shared cultural identity has broken down, is a lot of people coming into the country who aren't even interested in becoming American at all. And a lot of people are coming into the country and are basically just bringing small parts of their country with them. You know, Ilhan Omar was an example I used where, you know, right. she's still a Somalian. She's not an American. So I think we need something more concrete than a melting pot where we actually have a set concrete American identity. And we insist that if you're a newcomer to America, that's what you assimilate into rather than it just being this formless, shapeless melting pot where it can take anyone and everything. And, you know, and that's something I saw living in the Southwest. And part of the reason I left is I lived in a primarily Hispanic neighborhood. And I had a friend who had kids and their name, their last name was Carpenter. They were lily white, just like I was, but we lived in a Hispanic neighborhood. And I remember his kids running around with a Hispanic accent, even though they never been in Mexico, using Hispanic slain, dressing like little Hispanic gangbangers. And it was like, your name is Carpenter. You're freaking Irish. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you know, your, your lineage goes back to Ireland. You're not Mexican by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, I, I, there are people out there who are going to call me and probably you racist because we're thinking this, but I didn't want my kid to grow up immersed in a culture that was literally brought here from another country, practiced here from another country. And the people who were doing it refuse to acknowledge that this is America. We yeah. have a culture and they should follow that instead of trying to make New Mexico, Mexico. And I know there's there's people go, well, don't you see the irony? You're living in New Mexico. But, it, you know, the fact is New Mexico is still part of America. Yeah. And I believe we have a culture and there's nothing wrong with being proud of our culture. And I don't see anything racist by it because I think a lot of people of many different ethnicities, I hate the word race because we're all the same human race, but people from all different ethnicities want to practice being Americans. And that's why it was so upsetting watching young white Americans whose, whose parents acted as Americans, but growing up as Mexicans because we were in Mexican neighborhoods. A hundred percent. And to your point, the crazy thing about our immigration debate now is what you just said would have been common sense to Americans for most of American history. And it would be common sense to any country that actually is interested in protecting itself and surviving. Right. We're talking about, right. you know, are you as a country allowed to survive? Really, that's what we're talking about. Are you allowed to do what is necessary to make sure it's you survive and that you're able to pass on to your children something resembling the America that you grew up in. And what the scenario, the basic desire where that, that you were just outlining, that is a basic like survival mechanism for any country. But the crazy thing about our immigration policy is, you know, you'll get called racist for, for saying something like that. I wrote another poll, uh, column recently uh, on, on a similar topic about what's happening in Haiti. I don't know if you followed what's happening in Haiti, but the entire right. country is broken down and there's roving cannibal gangs in Haiti right now that are literally right. eating people that have taken over the country. Meanwhile, we've got mass Haitian immigration into America where people are coming by the tens, if not hundreds of thousands from Haiti into America. My point is, this is true of any country. When you import a large number of people from a foreign country into your country, your country ends up becoming more like the country they came from. This is common sense. It's been true of every immigrant group in America. America is a very different country today than it would have been if Irish and Italians hadn't come over in the 1900s. They brought parts of Italy and Irish Ireland with them and America became more like Italy and Ireland in some ways. The same is true of Haiti or Somalia or right. Mexico or any other country. And the conversation we have to have is we have to look at the countries people are coming from and say, do we want to be more like these countries or not? I look at Haiti, I look at Somalia, and I, I say, I don't want America, my country, to be more like these countries. That's commonsensical, yeah. but it's not something you're really allowed to say, which is insane. 
It is insane, but yeah, you ask me if I want to be like Haiti, hell no, because I, if anyone has seen the videos of, of yeah. them actually eating each other, is <laughs> that the type of values that you want to bring over to our country? And, you know, this is this is ritualistic um, uh, war. It's, it's spawned out of warring gangs, and it's spawned out of a ritualistic culture who believes in that type of thing. Where, like you said, we would be completely revolted. We, sh you know, it's revolting to us as Americans, and and it should be to most civilized Western nations that uh, this is going on. And just the fact that you and I are sitting here having this discussion, saying, "Well, gee, you know, do we should we, you know, should people be allowed to come here from those type of countries and bring that type of ritualistic behavior across?" And I, I, you made important and very important point when people came here from ireland and italian and my grandmother we used to always get into this argument she you know she was closer to the homeland of ireland you know where my lineage comes from than i was and she'd always tell us kids well you're irish and we'd go no grandma we're americans we're proud americans we believe as in the founding fathers believed we don't we don't even know the language from ireland we don't know the the laws of ireland we don't practice those laws here we are american we were born here and uh, our parents were born here and even you grandma were born here and you you know your your distant relatives may have come here from ireland but we are american and i don't understand why this has become to the well you know i do understand because they're trying to destroy our culture and in fact i would argue that's the biggest re reason why they want to bring all these what they call multiculturalism into this country. And that's another thing that people are not talking about as much anymore because it's already happening. They don't talk about multiculturalism because we're already practicing it. Right. No, a hundred percent. And by the way, you don't sound like the kind of libertarians I know. So maybe we are more aligned. The libertarians in DC at least are all for open borders. It's a big part open of their borders. So, so you're, I guess, in my estimation, you're one of the good libertarians, at least. But, um, but well, let me but, explain that. Uh, John sure. Galt wouldn't have had you come to Galt's Gulch and bring your socialistic tendencies to Galt, yeah. uh, Galt's Gulch. He had a border. It was, it was a surrounded place. You know what I mean? It was a pl yeah. place where if you wanted to go there, you had to live supporting yourself. And others weren't allowed to bring in their socialist endeavors. And so I, you know, I call myself a libertarian, but I'm, I'm an objectivist, an Ayn Rand type of objectivist. And anyone who doesn't believe that you can't protect your freedom without having rules for people who are going to come here, then that's really, to me, is the antithesis of libertarianism because of the fact you're going to lose that freedom by bringing others cultures who don't appreciate that freedom and appreciate those rights. And I argue with libertarians all the time about these open borders. And I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I thought it was a no, good no, point. you're exactly right. And I mean, what it really boils down to at the end of the day is if you believe in the concept of a nation or not, right? Yeah. So some of the libertarians, at least in DC, for them, liberty is this sort of abstract thing where all humans have you know, libertarian rights in all times and all places. So it's government tyranny to enforce your border. There's a different strain. And it sounds like you're familiar with libertarian thought called paleo libertarianism, which right. is much closer and that I share a lot of agreement with paleo libertarianism, which is a tradition that understands that you can want a very small limited government, but in order to protect the liberties that you believe in, you need a restrictive immigration policy because when you import millions of people from countries that don't have the tradition of liberty that we've inherited, guess what? They vote for you know gun restrictions, free speech right. restrictions, government welfare, all of that stuff, right? So that is a much more authentic and honest libertarianism, I think, which is one in, that understands I want limited government, and in order to get limited government, I need to restrict immigration because you need to have limited government in right. one country rather than globalism which ultimately leads to tyranny. And now, now, if if the rest of the world wanted to adopt that idea, then we could talk about open borders. You know what I mean? That, that would be a conversation. And if there were other countries who shared that type of philosophy, I could almost say I would want to have more free open borders with those type of people 
in say whatever country say germany but germany doesn't germany has very strict rules and they don't have the same freedoms that and well especially rights that are enumerated in the constitution and so yeah i you know it, how i don't understand libertarians who are like that i i you know i i like you said they 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 have this idea that people are just going to come to america and immediately go oh we're free and <laughs> and and accept our way of life but going back to Ilion omar she wants to bring somalian justice to our country how does that work you know how does that work you know right and the problem with the libertarians you're talking about is they don't think in terms of countries they think in terms of only the individual so if you are right. an individual from guatemala who wants to come to america it's your right to come here and who are we, you know, to restrict, to restrict that. But um, what you're getting at is the fact that countries and peoples are different from one another. This is actually true diversity. The left talks all about diversity. The true diversity is understanding that countries are different from us and the people who live there are different from us and their cultures are different and their customs and beliefs are different. And, you know, the getting back to the melting point, po melting pot point, the, you know, a lot of people, including a lot of conservatives up until pretty recently, have had this very naive fantasy of assimilation where you can bring a ton of people in here from radically different cultures and countries that have nothing in common with us. And over the course of you know a few years or whatever, they take the citizenship test. They're able to name, you know, checks and balances, schoolhouse rock stuff, and they'll be assimilated. They'll just become Americans no different from us. That is a fantasy. It's a dangerous fantasy, actually. You know, it. These things like cultures and right. people, they're sticky. They, they take generations, if that, to really change. You know, people like Ilhan Omar is not recognizably American in a lot of ways, right? And she says very openly that her loyalties are to Somalia and she raises her kids. They're going to be very similar. So what we're, happen what we're having, rather than assimilation, is we have a bunch of nations within a nation now where we're importing little slices of Somalia into Ilhan Omar's congressional district or little slices of Mexico into the place that you were living before. And they're just setting up shop here and they're not really changing anything from where they came from. So rather than them assimilating into America, America is just becoming fractured into real, like literally multiculturalism in, but right. in some ways like multinationalism, you have multiple different nations within the nation. I'm not interested in parts of my country becoming Somalia. I'm not interested in parts of my coming country becoming Mexico or anything else. I want America to be America, and I want America to be for Americans. And I think it is totally reasonable and just for Americans to demand that. And I think part of this comes from the agenda that's being pushed in government schools, public schools. I call yeah. them government schools. They're being indoctrinated. And I think if we had private schools where we'd had competition that most parents going back to the fifties, if you could get, go back to the fifties and get rid of these government schools that started indoctrinating kids, even back then, and you would have public schools who would push the American culture. And there's nothing wrong with other people keeping their identity but they still have to, you know, be, you know, their national identity as far as if you want to, you know, practice Somalian holidays, you want to eat Somalian food. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking yeah. about is you come here to our country and not our country, but this country, and you live by the rules of this country because they were established based on 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 individual rights and those rights are are something that are inalienable that no one can take away from you unless we start this multiculturalism where you've got somalians who are muslim who they throw gay people off of buildings and yet you and i are the ones who are called fascist because <laughs> we don't you know we don't want to practice the trans agenda, you know what I mean? Where people, because of their immutable qualities, they're given special privileges. We want individuals to be treated equally. Well, that's not how it's done in Somalian countries. And yet, if you talk to leftists who are gay, who are trans, they would say, oh, we need these people from all these different cultures to practice multiculturalism so that we become a more diverse 
and humane country, but yet it's the opposite of what you, you know, it's just like what you said. It's the, the opposite if you something happened, it glitched. Yeah, you uh cut out for a sec. I, I think you're back. I, I heard you up until the last sentence. Okay. Can you, can you hear me now? So, so what I'm saying is, is yeah. So what I'm saying is that the multiculturalism that people on the left would want us to practice, meaning allowing um, Elian Omar's um, culture to come in here would actually get the opposite effect because we wouldn't allow, I mean, if we were practicing Muslim law, they would throw gay people or trans people off a building Whereas in America, everyone is supposed to be treated equally because we all have individual rights. Right. And the other thing is they don't really believe in multiculturalism. Like when you break down what the left is doing, multiculturalism is a code word for being anti-American culture. So, you know, they're not they're not actually interested in, uh, you know, a diversity of all and every culture. They want cultures that are antithetical to the American culture in order to wage war on the traditional native American culture. And that has been true since the 1960s, at least. It's the same thing with diversity. You know, the left doesn't actually care about diversity. They care about pushing as many white people and especially straight white men out of institutions as possible. Like the left isn't concerned about diversity in the NBA. You know, they're not concerned about diversity on the hip hop and rap music charts, right? That's right. never where, you know, diversity is our strength, we're told. But for some reason, you know, they get they get a pass, right? They're worried about diversity in institutions that have too many white people. That's really what it's about. It's the same thing with multiculturalism, you know? The left isn't worried about, uh, you know, a multitude of cultures in Mexico, you know? They're not worried about right. them in Somalia. They want, quote unquote, multiculturalism here in America. And really what it's about is just cramming in as many anti-American cultures as possible to undermine the traditional ones. So that is, it's one of the great sort of lies that the left pushes that they really care about diversity and multiculturalism. They just hate America. I mean, it's very sort of, it sounds glib to say, but that's really what it's about when it boils down to that's it. That's literally what it's about. They hate yeah. America. They hate the, and, and I would even go further. They hate Western civilization. I mean, oh, you know, the, okay. It's and this is what they want to get rid of. And like you said, any any white male who is heterosexual, any white male uh, who practices uh, Christianity or Judaism and, and who practices a, a what we would call a Western religion, um, they are people. And by the way, I'm not religious at all. So it's it's uh, uh, it's not something that uh, I, I even have a, a fight a dog in that fight, but it's, it's like you said, they hate America and the only way they can destroy it is by, de by destroying that culture, by melting it down. This is the real melting pot by melting mm -hmm. down our American culture with all these other cultures that are antithetical to what we are supposed to represent in our country. And the reason they want to do that is because they want to rebuild it and not multiculturalism, but actual communism or fascism mm -hmm. in many ways, because I see both practiced on the left. Yeah, and this is why to bring it full circle, I have a problem with the concept of a melting pot is it's not strong enough to resist those attacks. Because if right. part of what the left is doing in order to get to that slate part where they can rebuild America as something radically different is making everything incoherent. They're making, you know, they're they are melting down the forms of American culture. There, as you were saying, and then once everything is just this inchoate melting pot goo of nothingness, then they can shape that again and rebuild it in their image. So to fight back, right. we need a much more concrete idea of American identity. What does it mean to be an American, and what do we expect you to conform to if you want to come to America and become a citizen? Which is not a shapeless melting pot. It's actually, no, this is America. This is what it means to be an American. This is what it means to not be an American. If you want to be here, you have to be an American. We need to be much more bold and speak in much more concrete terms if we're actually going to have a fighting chance at pushing back against this stuff. And that's where, and, and this is what I would argue, we have those principles. We have 
those values demonstrated in many of our founding documents. And this country was forged out of war. I mean, we fought for independence. We fought for that right. And and this is the irony that or the dichotomy people might point out is, well, is wasn't America created by European culture being being dominate dominating the other cultures that were here before us as they call native americans i don't like the term native americans i'm i'm a native american and but i I like the term american indians and the american indians who were here they were very proud people we should be you know we should acknowledge the great things they did before we came here but the fact was was that a european culture came over here dominated their cultures And which happens during, you know, that period in time in history. It was, you know, the period of conquest, the period of of people roaming and moving and being nomadic in their beliefs because they were being oppressed in one country. And of course, they go to another country and kind of oppress other people. But we tried to do the right thing in this country. And we tried to point out in our founding documents that there are certain individual rights that are either given to us by nature or by God. And those rights are everyone's, you know, everyone has these rights. And so what we tried to create was a better nation, a better nation based on constitutional Republic, which kind of was practiced by many, the Iroquois kind of practiced a, a Confederacy in itself, but it, you know, it was something that was pushed upon the uh, American Indians. Now don't, how would you answer someone who would say, then what you're arguing is, is really what happened to find, you know, the, for the founding of this country, you know, how would you argue against people would say, well, then you don't have a right to say that about other people coming here, bringing their culture because that's exactly how this country was founded. A couple of different things. First of all, America as a country did not exist before the European settlers. It was a continent of North America where you had a bunch of different nations. I mean, nation in a very primitive sense. They're often nomadic tribes. Some of them were very big and had a kind of developed civilization, but very primitive compared to where Europe was at the time. And it was just uh, the the continent of America was just a landmass where all these different tribes lived. But there was no unified government, no unified shared identity. And the other thing that is a corollary of that is the Native Americans, the indigenous. I agree. I consider myself a Native American. They're, you know, American Indians is a better term. Were brutal to one another for a millennia before we got there, which is not to justify everything that the settlers did to them. We can recognize that some of what the white European settlers did to the in American Indians was morally wrong, right? But it was not a deviation from the norm. And frankly, the reason that the settlers ended up being able to overcome and subdue the American Indians is because we had more advanced technology. The American Indians would have done that to one another many times over if they had the military strategy, if they had the military technology that we had, because they slaughtered each other for centuries before we got there. So the idea that the American Indians were sort of morally superior to the European colonists and that the European colonists committed this unique moral evil by colonizing them is absurd to anyone who spends five seconds reading about what the American Indians did to one another. I mean, if you actually go back and and read about it from the the reports and the scholarship at the time, really, you know, (laughs) grotesque stuff, in some ways transcending anything that the American colonists did to the Indians. Cannibalism, torture of children, you know, the whole nine. So again, there were atrocities that European colonists perpetrated against American Indians. But the reason we won was that we were more advanced, not that we were more brutal or more evil. At the very least, it's morally neutral. And in between the atrocities, we, to your point, you know, because the Europeans had this sense of rights and of human dignity and of a basic sort of justice that didn't exist in the American Indian world, we spent a lot of time trying to do right by the American Indians. We often fell short. We often did evil things sometimes. But the the other half of the story that isn't told is that uh, we were trading partners for centuries. We enriched and uh, made the American Indians 
substantially more developed in their civilization. They were party to a whole host of privileges that they would have never have gotten if we got there. And there were a lot of European colonists who really tried to actually apply their standard of justice to the American Indians as well. So yes, there were bad things that happened, but the moral distinction between the American Indians and the European colonists does not exist. And by the way, the American Indians, people don't know this, own black slaves. The major, the major American Indian tribes own black slaves and the seven quote unquote civilized tribes, that's what they're referred to, the major tribes, fought on the side of the Confederacy <laughs> in the Civil War because they, the Trail of Tears, which everyone talks about now, no one knows that there were black people on the Trail of Tears because they were slaves of the American Indians. And right. the, the Indian reservations were actually the last place in America where slavery was abolished because they didn't want to abolish slavery. So once we abolished it in the white Southern parts, we had to strike a completely different treaty with the American Indians to get them to abolish slavery. So they, again, we can say we did bad things to them. That is objectively true, but they were not, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, pictures of morality themselves. Innocent and babes like, in the woods, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, 100%. And, 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 you know, it's funny you talk about the uh, Trail of Tears uh, and how there were black slaves. The uh, the tribes themselves took black slaves along the Trail of Tears. And one of the people who, you know, being from the Southwest, be living in Harlingen, Texas, many, many, many years ago, we I remember the reasons they they celebrated Juneteenth Day. And part of that was because the the north had sent the cavalry to the southern part of texas to stop a certain tribe from continuing practicing slavery and yeah. holding black slave owners and yet that's kind of missed every juneteenth that uh the, yeah it's like hey it wasn't just the white people who were still practicing slavery in texas it was a huge indian tribe and i can't think of the indian tribe's name but uh yeah it, it people are blown away when they hear these things yeah, and it, I, I'm not as familiar with the Texas case, but what you're saying is what I was just referencing too, where there were multiple different major Indian tribes that the American government basically had to convince to abolish slavery. You know, we won, or the North won rather, the Civil War against the Confederacy. Slavery was gone in the sort of white parts of America. But the American Indians were like, well, we're not going to abolish slavery. We're doing great, right? And the American Indians had their own race codes you know, right. their version of sort of Jim Crow. They brutally put down slave rebellions in very, very brutal ways. Um, you know, they were slavers. And that, of course, is always left out of the story of the, the plight of the oppressed American Indians who could who never did any wrong themselves, right? Because it's inconvenient, right. you know, to the whole narrative. I, I know this whole idea that they lived in peace with nature yeah. and yes, it's, it's always, once again, it's kind of like the melting pot myth. Mm -hmm. It's an American myth and the left always tries to use that against anyone who doesn't know their history and know, knows the fact of how, if you go along the chronological order, you can see where the, the Europeans coming to America and you know they they had the Magna Carta to um, uh, to the to the Declaration of Independence and then to the um, uh, the U.S. Constitution um, in between that where the Articles of Confederation where you can see all of the development of that was rational objective thinking on how we can allow every single individual no matter what ethnicity they are no matter who they are whether you be poor, whether you be rich, that we have a justice system that treats everyone equally. And this was, and, and we got it wrong in the constitution because we still allowed slavery. And yet we fought a war over that very issue, which is, is always kind of ironic when they call us a, a, a racist uh, country. We fought a war where one race literally, and, and, like I said, I hate the term race, but where one race literally fought for the freedom of another race. And no one seems to acknowledge that we made mistakes. Yes, but we tried to make up for those mistakes. And, Not you know, that, that gets lost oh, that melting pot thing. 
Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but it's such an important point because it's it's just it's mind boggling that this is somehow overlooked. I mean, I, we know why it's overlooked because there's a there's an agenda, but we sacrificed an entire generation of our sons in a brutal, one of the most brutal civil wars in history at that point, civil war to abolish slavery, right? You know, that is, um, you know, that that's most countries and most peoples in across the history of human civilization would not have done that. Most people go to war right. to defend their interests, right? And if you just look at raw material interests, plenty of people had interest in maintaining slavery. Like it was great for the economy in the South, et cetera, et cetera. If, if you went to war for the reason that most nations went to war for throughout history, you know, there was no self-interested reason to abolish slavery. And yet we cared about it so much, so fiercely that we were willing, you know, literally brother against brother in, in civil wars, you know, in, in, and to, to essentially risk ripping our country in two because we felt that profoundly about it. So people talk about, you know, you listen to the left and they talk about how racist America is and, you know, we'll never get over the legacy of slavery. Slavery has been a constant across place and time throughout history. The Native Americans, right. the American Indians on slaves, Africans, you know, took each other in slaves. In the Middle East, they still have slavery in some parts. You can go down the list. So American, American slavery was not unique at all. What was unique about America is how committed we were to ending slavery and so committed that we were willing to sacrifice an entire generation of young Americans in order to do that. But of course, if you hear the left tell it, you'd think that America is the only place where slavery ever existed and we've never right. done anything to atone for our sin. Yeah, you can go back to the ancient civilizations of Sumeria and like you oh, said, yeah. in the Middle East and they had slavery. And today there are slave markets in Somalia that are still going on. And uh, today, to, you know, there are people being auctioned off on, on, on the auctioning block, uh, humans. And, you know, for most Americans, that's just absolutely mind boggling. But the sad part is, is now because we have these open borders, there is a slave trade that has been created on the open border for workers, for sex workers, for children, that are being tra traded right now. And our government, not only is it allowing it to happen, but we're participating in the process of, of enabling child predators to get children for their sex trade, young women for their sex trade. And this is all due to open borders. And this, once again, makes me angry at libertarians who say, oh, well, we need open borders. It's like, you don't see the atrocities that bad people will uh, will commit at the advantage of having an open border into a country like ours. Right. And that's the thing is when you hear people talk about our border crisis, our immigration crisis, a lot of people make it seem as if it's this sort of spontaneous thing that's happening because we've got a porous border and people are just traveling up from all over the world. That's not how mass immigration works. It is actually a very designed, coordinated system that is run from you know, the beginning to the end by these major cartels, often working hand in glove with American nonprofits and NGOs, which are the sort of unspoken evil cause of the, of the border crisis. It's not just our government policy. We've got these huge nonprofits, left-wing nonprofits that are helping people up from South America or wherever into the border. But the cartel is staging at every stage of the way. And these cartels are almost, they're so powerful. They're almost like pseudo governmental entities. They've got right. a governing system and courts and everything. And you do not get from Guatemala or wherever to the American border to Eagle Pass in Texas without going through the cartel. You, it is the only way up is to go through the cartel. So it's a system. It's a really designed system uh, it's not just random people who wake up one day and decide, you know, I want to come to America and then they make the trip up. And um, and it is, to your point, it's enabling things like sex trafficking. It's also in another way enabling a kind of slavery because this is why big corporations love the open border so much is they can import people who work for, you know, cents on the dollar. And it's creating this class of sort of indentured servants who are effectively yeah. a slave class in the shadows in America 
Um, and and uh, corporations in some ways have found a way to sort of take back slave labor. They're just doing it through mass immigration rather than uh, American chattel slavery in the South. And, and and yeah, like you said, this is these this is by design, and it's being run by cartels who have just as much money as many different governments. Yep. And they have a military to back up what they're doing. They're very organized. They're very technologically advanced. And they're using our system against us. And the, the sad part is, is I, you're a young man. I How old are you? 25. 25. I would kill to be 25 again. But uh, when I was a young man back in the early 70s, uh, uh, mid-70s, on the border of Texas and New Mexico, you could walk back and forth on the border. It was not a big deal. And part of the reason is we enforced immigration laws, one, and two, they didn't have the cartels there to uh, nearly as bad as what they are today, but majorly was because we enforced our immigration laws. And because we enforced the immigration laws, we didn't have to have a fence. We didn't have to have the wall. We could walk back and forth across the river, swim in the river, and nobody had a problem with this. And so this is something that's unique to the past 20, 30, or 20 or 30 so years, especially in the last, since about the mid 2000s, that is really amped up, that has really started to become a huge problem. And of course, they're blaming climate change. My favorite is they blame climate change for this mass migration, not the fact that uh, people are being incentivized to come here. So we are incentivizing our own destruction by bringing the multiculturalism here. And the leftists, like you say, are using the melting, melting pot myth to basically excuse all of that. A hundred percent. You know, it's it's obviously with all these things, there's multiple different factors. It's the fact that we're not enforcing our border. It's the fact that the cartels exist in a much more advanced sort of state. It's the fact um, that, uh, you know, that, that, in, that the story gets down from people in America, right? You pass on to your uncle or your aunt, or your family, like, hey, you know, the border is open. It's super easy. You just have to claim asylum. Say you're a, you know, political refugee or something and they'll let you right in. And that story spreads to the whole town, et cetera. But in some ways, like this, is, it's the, the border crisis is our fault. Like on an individual right. level, I don't blame some destitute, poor Guatemalan living in a violent cartel infested hellhole for wanting to come to America. I'd want to come to America too. I'd probably try, you know, if, if that was the option, I would try to get my family out there, try to get to America. That's just human nature. But if right. we want to survive as a country, we have both an obligation and a duty and a right to make sure that that doesn't happen because it's destroying our country. The other reason for the poll is uh, things like our welfare state, right? This is a big part of it is, and this is where the sort of paleo libertarian thing gets in is if you want to have a functional welfare state at all, any kind of social safety net, you can't do mass immigration. Because when you have these generous, you know, dole outs to people, and then when you start saying, like we started saying a few decades ago, that illegals can get that, they can go to your public schools, they can get your Medicare and Medicaid, they can get all of the other welfare benefits, you know, 90% of the world doesn't have access to that in their home countries. So they're all going to want to come here, right? right. So you open the border and then you sweeten the deal with checks and welfare and, you know, healthcare and stuff. And who wouldn't want to come to this country when you do that? So that, that is a big problem as well. Yeah. I, I can only imagine that brochure, any American yeah. reading it for any other country would be going, heck, how do I, how do I sign up for this? Yeah. And, um, going back to, um, the Indian tribes. Um, I should have asked this when we were on that, but going back to the Indian tribes, we have now created nations within inside a nation, which because one group of people, the Indian tribes are being treated differently than the people who are surrounding them in their counties and their states. They're beating, you know, and, and we see this many different times in Oregon where they're giving the, the, the Indian tribes are given certain privileges and certain access to lands and hunting that the rest of the population is not given that privilege to. And 
it's creating an animosity almost it's it's creating government initiative initialized or initi in, initiating government racism in itself do you think it was a good idea for us to create those nations within inside of a nation and if not what should have been done you know at the small scale that it really is nationwide you know we started we created the the um the reservations a long time ago very early in american history and you know they've changed over right. time to an extent but i think in a healthier country without mass immigration you know where we're still a relatively homogenous population mostly westerners you know, you can quibble over, you know, at the local level, maybe where you're talking about those laws could cause conflict and you could reassess it. Maybe it's not working. That's fine. But it seemed like within the sort of limits of broadly a workable arrangement, right? You know, you conquered the American Indians. It's over. You won, right? You set up an American government and you want to do right by them within limits. So you give them, you know, their land where they can practice their religion and do their customs and still sort of be American Indians. And you kind of leave the rest of the country to Americans. And, um, you know, you've got parts of the country where there's really big reservations, but for the most part, it was little sort of enclaves and it was fine. You know, we, we were managed to sort of make it a workable arrangement. The problem is a, when you start introducing mass immigration, right on top of all of that. And then B, when you have this cultural breakdown, where all we can do now is be ashamed of ourselves and all we can ever talk about is how awful our history was and how awful we were to the American Indians, and how awful we were to slaves, et cetera. And then you start having, uh, you know, again, you're losing the sort of sense of confidence and will to defend yourselves. And also people like, you know, American Indian activists become much more militant and demanding. And they yeah. start, you know, they're raised in schools where they're taught that, you know, they were, sinned against and that America is an evil country and that they should take their revenge on America. So then they start building coalitions where they start demanding this and that and this and that from the American government and the politicians in American government, the Americans are so ashamed of themselves. They just give them everything that they ask for. And that's what we're seeing now. It's just not, it's not just the American Indians. It's a lot of other minority groups too, but collectively that becomes very toxic very quickly. And, and yeah, that's, and, and we're seeing that play out and you know how the government, the state government of Oregon and the federal government, they, they know how to divide people yep. and they really use these policies to divide people so that once again, they create the problem. They, they see the reaction they, they manipulate the reaction and then they offer a solution, which is never nothing good. Um, and so, yeah, that's to me, that's it's going to be a big problem down the road. But like you said, then you're introducing the multinationalism that's coming in at the at the percentage it's coming in. We're talking, you know, I think the official numbers is 11 to 12 million. And I, I bet it's probably more about 20 million. It's 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 huge. So my question to you is it was a good article and i agree with you about the melting pot being a myth and that we need to start looking at this country who's who's at fault here and 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 i and i'll remind you that under trump in 2016 for the first two years of his presidency the republicans had the senate they had the house for two years and nobody did nothing about the immigration laws so whose fault is it? And, you know, and I know you could go back to it's the people's fault because we've chosen idiots for representatives. But uh, but tell me whose fault is it and what can be done about it? Well, it's a lot of different people's fault. I think at this point, it's almost the system's fault. Like the, there's a built in system that is very difficult to unravel that is not only facilitating all of this, but is making it very difficult to do anything serious about it. So look, you know, you can criticize any politician. You can certainly criticize Trump for missteps on this stuff. But what needs to be said in all fairness is Trump came in wanting to do something about it. And he got fought tooth and nail every single step of the way to be able to do anything about it. And he finally started to break through towards like the last year of his administration. We actually brought down immigration levels for the first time in a very long time. So he, he, he made it through, but if, you know, we don't have to get into the, all the details, but if you follow the saga of Trump trying to do border security over his presidency, it is insane 
the kinds of things that they threw at him, not just the yeah. system, not just people inside his own administration, but Republicans in Congress. You know, Paul Ryan and, and Mitch McConnell tried to kill Trump's border security measures. And so, yeah, you had this Republican trifecta. Voters voted for them almost primarily because of his immigration message. That's why Republicans turned out to vote. And Trump wanted to do something. You know, his people in his administration wanted to do something. Some Republicans in Congress wanted to do something. A lot of Republicans didn't because, you know, they know where their bread is buttered and their bread is buttered by big corporations that love cheap labor. Right. So, I, you know, I, I really am. I, I find it almost unforgivable, the GOP establishment, that we had this once in a lifetime opportunity to actually finally get serious about that. And they totally sabotaged Trump. And then on top of that, you had people in his own administration who were fighting him. You had people in the court system who were fighting him. Every step of the way, you know, you, he almost got there and then someone pulled the rug out, right? So um, that, I think, the lessons of the Trump administration on this issue are how built in the system is and how difficult it is to take him on. I think the Trump era, or at least his first administration, gave us a lot of lessons that we can apply next time. And I think that Trump will hopefully be able to apply if he gets back into office. But the – but um, – so it's possible, but it's very difficult to sort of unravel the system. On top of that, I mean, obviously you've got right now like Biden and the Democratic politicians, and they're making things worse in a lot of ways, certainly. But there's this built-in system, like we said, and it's not just the government. It's also, like I was saying, these big left-wing networks of NGOs and nonprofit. You've got the Soros Network, which is huge, the Open Society Foundation. You've got yeah. some yeah. Christian charities that are really – actually playing a really bad role in this. You've got uh, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. There's this huge network, Amnesty International, the United Nations, of these extremely powerful, you know, gajillion dollar NGOs and nonprofits, which are not just lobbying for open borders policies, but are actually down there on the border and even south of the border with maps showing illegals how to get up to America. And then they've got lawyers at the border, coaching the illegals on what to say so that they can manipulate right. the asylum laws. They give them scripts in Spanish and English to say, this is what you tell a border patrol agent because then you'll get asylum. You know, like those guys, we don't talk about them as much. We spend a lot of time talking about what's happening in government, but we're not going to solve this issue until those guys are brought to heel because they really are the sort of the fourth wall in, in this sense. And then you have the NGOs who will give them all the information on how to uh, applicate or uh, apply for all the government programs that yeah. are out there. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. So if Trump gets in, by the way, were you a big Trump supporter in 2016? In 2016, I was 16 or 17 years old and I was I was still kind of a liberal. Like, you know, I was I became okay. a conservative by the end of high school, beginning of college. So I was just sort of figuring out that I was conservative or Republican at all. So, you know, I had these inherited liberal views where in 2016, I didn't fully understand Trump. I sort of believed what the media said about him. So in 2016, I was not a Trump guy. Over the course of the next sort of three years, I went under underwent this sort of private, personal, like ideological transformation. But I also, part of that was just I was paying attention. So you begin by believing everything the media says about him. And then you kind of see right. this one thing, you're like, wait, the media lied about that. You know, Trump was right about that. And you see another thing, you're like, oh, wait, Trump was right about that. The media lied about him and they lied about him here and they lied about him here. And then you slowly realize that like everything they say about the guy isn't true. And he was actually right about all this stuff, you know? And over time right. you start to learn that. And, you know, now I love Trump, but I, but it took me a few years to get there. I, I have a theory that uh, young men uh, going back to 14, maybe even 12 year old young men, especially possibly a lot of young women as well uh, who were developing during the Trump presidency, I think are going to be, he, we're going to find that there's a lot more of them who are now of voting age between let's say 18 and 22 who are going to be more, supporting of Trump just oh, yeah. because they grew up under his presidency. Ronald Reagan was it for me. You know, I, I couldn't vote for Ronald Reagan in 1980, but 1984, I had a Ronald Reagan, you know, 
all the way. And, and, you know, it was the same thing because I watched what the man did and he gave you hope, you know, real hope, not that crap that Obama was selling, mm -hmm. but uh, just because of his actions, not because he was saying, I'm giving you hope. And so, uh, yeah, it was very distressing in 2020 to see what happened to us. But um, this kind of ties in with something else that I wanted to uh, talk with you, but I've got to go real quick. If you can hold on, can you hold on for a few minutes more? I got a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. I've got to go to a quick uh, advertiser and then uh, we'll uh, come back to this conversation because this is going to lead me into a question about DeSantis. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. I'm going to bring him on stage. Oh, that didn't happen. Let's try it again. Hey, Josh, how you doing? I'm doing good. Where's Tim? Where the hell's Tim? Tim is putting headers on a 13 Ram and he said, you do it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> not much uh, of a conversation there. No, not no. at all. Boy. So what's happening over at Tom and gigs today? Uh, Tim, like I was talking, Tim's putting some JBA headers on a Ram 1500. Those are nice. pretty notorious for exhaust manifold leaks. Uh, breaking bolts and that and um so he's putting those on and gonna put a flow master muffler on it um uh, then austin just finished up a set of amp research steps on a brand new jeep uh 392 four-door rubicon wrangler so that was pretty fun those came out good um then finished the day with alignment so nice nice so you can get all that done at tom and gigs and you guys will take people take care of people with those automotive needs. Yeah. I tell everybody we do everything but internal engine work. Um, Jasper transmissions. We got one of those coming in next week. You're we specialized in suspension alignments, brakes, you know, general vehicle repair. Um, Tim's really good at custom exhaust. Uh, we got a 60, I think it's a 1960 Corvette coming in next week. We're going to do custom duels on for a guy. Um, but yeah, we're just turning and burning. Nice, sweet. And you can still get RC cars there? Yep, we got the Traxxas RCs. Today's our last day of the sale. Um, got that going on. Joe's kind of pretty much sold us out of RC cars. Um, nice. Doing good out there. We've got the showroom full of accessories. I, that's kind of my big thing is, you know, accessories and, you know, selling the jobs. That's kind of my job here, so doing that we're just cranking along but you know invite people to come out and see us and uh you know we're one block off newmark on the way to empire right before 7-eleven big green building on the left american flag flying out front and uh we're open monday through friday eight to six and saturday ten to two well thank you very much i appreciate that and let tim know i, I know i'm not as good as tim at this oh that's all right he would have had a quote for us you have a quote for us something i, I don't know i don't there, All right. you know, I'm not up to Tim's standards on podcasts, but you know, he was just running and he wanted to get that done for the customer. So I'm just oh, kind of winging cool. it right now. All right. You did a great job, Josh. I appreciate you, man. Hey, thank you for what you do. And uh, we'll talk to you later, Rob. All right. You take care. And that's one of our great American automotive centers out there. And uh, yeah. That's, that's Americana. You know what I mean? That's, that's, right. you know, we talked about the American culture. These guys work on a lot of old classic cars and, you know, it's, it, it's, the, they watch what's going on in their neighborhoods. They live in a, a the business itself is uh, in the empire neighborhood of, of Coos Bay, which is where they have been able to basically corral all the homeless people who are on drugs and whatnot. And it's just horrible. What's, what's going on, the crime and all mm -hmm. that here in little old Coos County out here on the Southern Oregon coast, they're trying to make Portland or they're trying to make Coos County like Portland, wow. you know, and it's, how big, it's is, uh, how big is Coos County? Coos County is uh, where I think we got about 60,000 people here. Okay. So really there's a, there's a homeless and crime problem there, even though it's huge. It's really? huge. Wow. Oh, we're fighting it. And, uh, you know, the commissioners, it's funny. We, we told them not to create this. The governor got a whole bunch of money to hand out to different counties, but the counties had to create a homeless committee. And we, we warned our county commissioners not to do that. And it created a homeless committee. And now 
the money is just flowing in here and all they're doing is enabling drug addicts yeah. and none of them are homeless. None of them, if you gave them a home, they would destroy it in three months. And yeah. it's a homeless industrial complex, which is much like what's going on at the border. It's the destruction of our government so they can come in and take it over and, and create it and build it up. And, and basically like the Chinese government is the way I think they really want to go which is kind of ironic because they don't have multiculturalism in China. Now do they? Oh, funny how that works. You know, it's, uh, it's <laughs> the Chinese are not okay with mass immigration, actually. You know, maybe not. Uh, there's something, something to that. Um, is Coos County pretty Republican? I think I remember it being. 58% of us voted for Trump in the last okay. election. And we had like a, it was like a 78, 79% turnout. So wow. we, we are huge Republican fans here. Yeah. Um, you actually worked for the DeSantis campaign, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I was a speechwriter for a few months. And, um, you know, obviously mixed feelings about DeSantis and the campaign and how it ended up. But, um, you know, I was never like anti-Trump. I basically, I was a young kid. I was writing for outlets out. I was sort of a young conservative writer in D.C., and I got a call from a mutual friend who was linked up with the DeSantis campaign who said they're looking for a speechwriter. You know, you want to come down and uh, and give it a shot. I, I can't even remember if Trump had officially announced at that point. But I was like, yeah, you know, I like DeSantis. It would be fun to be a speechwriter. It would be great to have an experience working on a campaign. So why not? Right. But I was never really going down because yeah. I hated to work for him because I hated Trump or thought he shouldn't get, you know, it would be the worst thing ever if he got the nomination. Like I always knew that I liked Trump and I'd be happy to vote for him. You know, I just got offered a speechwriter position on this campaign. So I went down and, and, uh, and wrote for them. But, um, it, uh, it pretty soon, like almost immediately after I got there, I have some texts I sent my, my buddies that I could whip out in like March, 2023, like two months before DeSantis even announced being like, we're going to get crushed. Like it just became immediately apparent that um, there was no chance in hell that DeSantis was going to beat Trump. Um, and that was obviously true. I, I think he just was in before his time. He should have waited another four years because I, I, I like DeSantis. And yeah. I would have been, you know, if he was the one in the race right now and it wasn't Trump, I'd be fully behind him as well. And the only reason I'm not going for a libertarian candidate is because I might as well vote for the oak tree that's outside my window yeah. here. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, uh, it's ridiculous, even though he's not going to win Oregon by any stretch of the imagination. You're still kind of, you know, no matter what you vote, it's, it goes to the Democrats all the time. And that's the sad situation here. Um, but uh, I also, I, and I want to thank you for coming on to my podcast because I've just had to restart a, a whole career in, in social media because I was on the radio. I was mm -hmm. on the radio for seven years, two years as a co-host, five years as a host, only conservative radio talk show in the entire county and uh, had a huge audience. And I got canceled. I got canceled by a Republican senator because I found out he was lying on several of his bills. And I found out that his largest contributor was a billionaire from San Francisco who was a Democrat. Not only was he registered as a Democrat in, in California, he was registered for the independent party here. And he's been voting in both elections. And I just happened to point that out and got punished for it, for the, the wow. he complained, the senator complained. The billionaire guy, uh, from what the owner of the station told me, was that he was threatening a lawsuit. Of course, he says he denies that now, but uh, um, I got canceled. My contract, literally, he said, I'm canceling your contract. So I wow. literally got canceled. And so now I've started over doing a podcast where I'm lucky to reach uh, anywhere between a thousand to 2000 people, but at least I know if they're coming to watch my show, they're doing it because they actually like it. Whereas the radio, you still only got two to 4,000 listeners. And yet these were listeners who were just in their car sometimes with the radio yeah. on, you know what I mean? So yeah. I appreciate you coming here because I understand you kind of got canceled as well because you, you just complimented someone who you, you didn't even appreciate in the conservative movement, and that was Nick Fuentes, right? Who is much more infamous now than he was then. Like back yeah. then, 
nobody knew really knew uh, since he had you know dinner with Trump and it became a huge thing. But you know, this is uh, I've been canceled a couple times. I've managed to survive, thankfully, and, and bounce back, which is nice. You know, thank God for that. Um, but it was the whole th situation was absurd. Like I was on this thing called like a Twitter space, which is basically just like a live group call or something. And uh, Nick Fuentes hopped on. We weren't expecting him, but he he popped up and uh, we ended up getting in an argument for like 45 minutes. But in the first like two sentences or five sentences or whatever the argument, like I made a couple like jokes and said something, I, I guess, like complimentary about him. And then people, you know, pulled that out and made it into this whole hit piece. And it was a whole thing. But um, it was uh, it was the same thing like like you, where, like it was Republican going after you. It was like conservative media that canceled me. And I, right. you know, I nothing but contempt for those guys. I think it, the whole thing is absurd. Well, you know, it cracks me up. These are the same people who whine, bitch, and complain when the left does it to them. And then they have no problem using that same tactic against anyone else that uh, they think they can score points against and yeah. you know this is this is was one of the top senators he was the one who didn't walk out during the senate in the last legislature mm -hmm. i don't know if you heard about that yeah, um, of course. we said that was great the only time i felt represented in oregon a long time when those eight senators left and yeah. we had some really good ones in fact dennis linthicum is going to be on the show in a couple of weeks and so uh yeah it's it's sad when that happens and especially after reading your articles, you're an intelligent young man. I think you got your head on straight and uh, I hope we can get you back on sometime uh, in the future. Would that be all right? Absolutely. It was a ton of fun. So I'm happy to come back anytime. Just let me know. You got it anytime. And I want to thank you for your time today and uh, I'll be sure to uh, make sure and get this out as much as I can. And uh, well, yeah, I guess you take care. How's what you going to do? Anything exciting coming up? Well, you know, I'm in D.C. doing a lot of political projects, which I, I can talk more about, you know, a little later. But I'm working on some exciting stuff. So hopefully it depends how the next election goes. But I think we've got some exciting stuff in the works. If Trump gets back in, it's going to be fun in this city. I think there's going to be a lot of good stuff. So, you know, knock on wood. Uh, is there any place that uh, you would like to send the listeners if you'd find like to find out more? I just put up the uh, spectator.org website because I know you're a right a writer for the American Spectator. Yep, I write for them. And if you want to sort of follow my feed and see my articles, I post them on my Twitter. So my Twitter is at N J Hawkman, H O C H M A N. N J Hawkman. Follow me there. I post all my stuff there. I apologize. I pronounced your name wrong. And I even and looked it up. I'm closer than most people. Everyone watches okay. it, but you are closer than most other people. So. Yeah. All right. Well, I, please forgive me. I'll get it right next time. Okay, Nate? That's totally fine. All right. Well, you take care. All right. Yeah, you too. All right. Thank you. All right. That was, that was a very interesting conversation. And like I said, I hope, uh, you know, well, I, I guess I really don't care if they call us racist. Uh, you know, they're going to call us all kinds of names. That's just, just the way, you know, the left is that's the way just people are They're You know, if you don't agree with them, you think that uh, your country should have a closed border or your country should, uh, should not be uh, having people come in from all over the world who, don't, who do not share our same values. And then when they get here, they want to live like they lived in the country they came from. Well, why don't you just stay in the country you came from? That would be just easier if you would just do that. But uh, they don't want to do that. It's, it's a very sad situation. And so I hope you all go check out Nate at spectator.org. That's the American Spectator. I've been reading them. Wow, probably longer than Nate's been alive. And uh, that's, you really know your age when you're having guests on the show who you've been reading uh, the, the magazine or the uh, news outlet that they've been working for longer than that person has been alive. I, 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 have, I hate to even admit that, uh, but uh, well, you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. And I want to thank you all for tuning in. We've, I've got Dennis Linthicum, who's going to be coming on the show. I've got James Heath, who's going to be coming on the show. Uh, this Friday, I got Ben Edel. Ben Edel is going to come on the show. Can you believe this? We have had received a uh, cease and desist letter from uh, the attorney of, da of Senator David Brock Smith. This is how he bullies people. 
And uh, I'll tell you what, it's not going to work. I'm not going to be quiet. Uh, what I tell people about David Brock Smith is true. I can back up what I say. But in fact, I have a right to have my opinion about David Brock Smith and him using an attorney trying to silence me. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, we're going to talk more about that uh, uh, later on because I think it's absolutely disgusting what uh, this senator is trying to do to us. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to put up with it anymore. And so, David, you can send all the cease and desist letters you want, but it's not going to stop me from from telling people what you have done, what you have done to our friends. Um, you know, and, and I say our friends is because me and David actually used to have the same friends and he's he's threatened a couple of them. And I, I, those friends would be more than happy to come into a court of law and testify against that. So you want to sue me? Go ahead and sue me, David. I'd love to see that, but we're not going to take your crap anymore. So, um, and I'm sorry that uh, we weren't able to uh, continue with the uh, Where's 3H Trick service today. We'll do it next week. We'll do it next week. But like I said, I've got a lot of good guests coming on and uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things. Uh, just in case uh, you're interested, I know there are people who are still interested in what's going on in the local government here in Coos County, but uh, we're going to be having a POC meeting. Uh, this is tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. at the Coos County Courthouse. And actually, it's not at the courthouse. It's at the Owens Building, which is a block away from the courthouse. It's at 201 North Adams and Coquille. And uh, we're going to be talking, uh, let's see, I got the agenda here. They're going to be discussing, what are the commissioners going to be discussing? Well, let me tell you, what are the commissioners going to be discussing? Well, the commissioners are going to be talking about the competitive bidding exemption on design, build, procurement of the water treatment facilities at Laverne Park. So that's a public hearing tomorrow. So I recommend you uh, show up and check it out. But uh, they're going to be doing a lot of different things. Um, nothing that I would 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 uh, say would trigger uh, all of us showing up, but I think some of us should show up. I'm probably going to be there tomorrow. And of course, tomorrow, the city of Coos Bay, the largest city in Coos County, well, they're going to be having their city council meeting, and it's going to be happening at the city hall building at 500 Central Avenue, and uh, they're going to be uh, discussing things that are going on in the city. So I know some of you still care. You still actually give a damn about those type of things, so I hope you tune in. Uh, you know, and, and I have to give credit to where credit's due. I have to give uh, credit to my sponsors. They're kick-ass sponsors. Only kick-ass sponsors would uh, would sponsor a show like this, and that is 3H Tree Service. <coughs> 3H Tree Service. You got any of those Antifa trees? You know, the ones that uh, are bug infested. Uh, they got diseases. Uh, they can catch fire at any moment. Yeah, those are the Antifa trees. Uh, if you need to have those taken out, uh, 3H Tree Service can do that for you. Uh, give them a call at 541-294-1800. Once again, that's 541-294-1800. And check out uh, uh, their Facebook page under the same name, 3H Tree Service. And you can check out Matt. He's, he'll be 90 feet in the air with a chainsaw in one hand and a cigarette in another just topping those trees like nobody's business. Why? Because he's a macho man. man. It's not toxic masculinity. No, it's just a good old fashioned masculinity. And he's still doing what men do. And that's a uh, real work out there. So kudos to you, Matt. I'll talk to you later tonight. And of course, uh, my other sponsor is, if I can get the slide working there, Tommy Giggs. If you need any of your automotive uh, services need, uh, fulfilled, you can go over to Tommy Giggs and they can take care of that. Uh, they can, uh, if you need a remote control car, you can get them there. Um, mufflers, this guy Tim. I mean, you know, if you if you want your little Honda car to sound like it's a big badass truck, he can do that for you. He can do that for you with the mufflers. So I recommend you check out Tommy Giggs. Uh, one of the other things that uh, you can do is uh, get, uh, like I said, the remote control cars. And they got Tannerite. So you just think about that. You get a remote control car and you combine that with the Tannerite and then you can blow the shit out of those things. I don't know, you know, maybe you can uh, drive it under uh, other things and blow it up. I don't know. Maybe you got squatters. You got squatters? Well, you might want to consider some Tannerite. I'm not making any uh, suggestions there. It's just something you might want to think about. Uh, and of course, 
someone who's been with me from the very beginning is Oregon Firearms Federation. Oregon Firearms Federation, they're the only no compromise gun organization in Oregon. If it wasn't for the Oregon Firearms Federation, you wouldn't have your gun rights here in Oregon. And you you would, don't expect the Republicans to help you out. The Republicans, they've been AWOL most of the time on a lot of these gun laws. In fact, they just, uh, a, a Republican group from uh, Marion County, they were trying to push the constitutional carry initiative. Now you would think an initiative that important, a constitutional carry initiative that important that they would have been able to get enough signatures. No, they failed. <clears throat> they completely failed. And I know you're probably asking, well, why doesn't Oregon Firearms Federation do their own constitutional carry initiative? Because no matter how good of an initiative that we put on the ballot, even if it passes into law, which there's a good chance it wouldn't because we're outnumbered by the Democrats. The Democrats don't want you to own guns. No, they don't want you to own guns. They don't want you to protect your own property. They don't even believe in having private property. They think everyone should have access to what you own. Well, that's bullshit. You know it. I know it. But Oregon Firearms Federation, they're trying to defend that. And so they don't want to put that on the ballot because it would cost a lot of money. What they're doing is they're fighting like against Measure 114 that uh, a bunch of leftists put on the ballot. And of course, the leftists, because they're the majority here, voted for the crap. And we've stalled it up in court. We've stalled it up in Harney County. Uh, we've got a federal lawsuit going on against Measure 114, and we're stopping that process. Uh, we're stopping it dead in its tracks. And uh, if Measure 114 passes, it would be one of the most stringent gun laws in the entire country. So thank your lucky stars that you're fortunate enough to uh, live in a state that has Oregon Firearms Federation. Don't give to your local Republican Party. Give to the Oregon Firearms Federation. I'd appreciate it. And if you need to practice your firearms, these people at the Band and Gun Club, they're not my sponsors, but I like to promote them because, well, they're really cool people and they deserve to be sponsored. And if you want to go out there, they've got a, a five stand trap for trap shooting. Uh, take your trap rifle out there. I mean, they're right. You take your trap shotgun out there. Uh, check out the five stand trap shoot and uh, it's badass. They, you got traps going all different directions and uh, you can take them out and hone those skills. If you want to practice uh, with your handgun, they've got a handgun pistol range. They can take care of that too. They're really cool that way. What can I tell you? And if you, you need to go and practice with your rifle, you can go to Tioga, Tioga Sports Park right next to the dump. You know, right on Highway 101 between Bandon and Coos Bay. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Those guys are great out there. Tioga Sports Park. Go check them out and see what they're doing. I think you would appreciate all the things they do for us. And uh, they offer the ability for people to go out there, shoot their pistols, shoot their rifles. They got a 150 yard range out there. They're gonna open that range up to 600 yards. It's gonna be really badass. You can go out there uh, with your 300 blackout and just shoot the hell out of uh, your guns. It's gonna be a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I want to thank everyone who's, uh, like I said, who's joining me. I've been having a great time. I, I really think if you go to the American Expectator, uh, go check out Nate Hockman. Uh, he kicks ass. What can I tell you? And I'm going to continue kicking ass. So like I said, join us. Join us uh, Friday night. We're going to have a Friday night uh, rant with Ben Edel. It's going to be very interesting. And uh, yeah. You're going to find out where we're going to go with this cease and desist letter. I can't believe someone sent me a cease and desist letter. Why? Because I'm telling the truth. And they don't like when people tell the truth. But I'm not going to stop. And I hope you don't stop tuning in. But you can tune in this Friday. Same place. Same bat channel at 7 o'clock. And we're going to have Ben Edel on here. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And until Friday, carry on, Coos County. Carry on. <laughs>